another another big SEC game. We had a uh, five game stretch of five straight quad one games, which you know it's a great opportunity. It's also you know tough stretch, so we can look at it two ways. We're going to try to look at it as a great opportunity to improve our resume, play good teams. You know, with um, Indiana State losing a couple and Oregon not staying in the top 50 of the net, I think we're down to only two quad one wins. So if we got five of them in a row, we can get some more quad one wins, improve our resume. And now, you know, the other side is you're trying to win the league, and we've got the toughest remaining schedule of all the contenders in the SEC. So we, we're going to play well. So told our guys that, but. You know, it, it's. I think our non-conference schedules prepped us for this run. We're going to have to come out and play well. We've got Florida twice in the next five games. We've got, you know, we're on the road at Kentucky. We're on the road at Ole Miss, and then we got Tennessee at home. So we've got a tough stretch. Florida's very good. Shoot, they're uh, leading the country in rebounds per game. They're number two in offensive rebounding right behind A&M. So we got the top two teams in the country and offensive rebounding back-to-back -back games. We didn't do a great job keeping A&M off the glass. We got to do a better job against Florida, you know, but they're going to have to guard us too. So we, we've got the number one offense in the country. They're going to play two bigs. One of their bigs is going to have to guard a guard and We'll see how that goes. We've got to do a better job rebounding. They're, they're going to have to figure out how to guard our guards. So it'll be kind of a two different styles matchup. You know, Coach Colton's done a great job. It's two years at Florida, and he's got the program back. I think this is the first time since 07 that Alabama and Florida are playing each other where both teams ranked in the top 25. So it's good for us. It's good for our fans to have a home game like this. Two top twenty-five teams. It's good for the SEC, and but we, we gotta we're gonna have to play well to win. Yeah, coach, you already mentioned it, but the offensive rebounding rate after kind of the success that Texas A&M was able to have on the glass, uh, even though you're all able to get to win, um, how have you have you changed any of your preparation in terms of uh, being prepared for that? I'm mean, just trying to continue to emphasize it. It's you know we emphasize it before A&M and. I did. I we kind of made three points. We got to turn them over more, so there's less shots to get rebounds. We didn't do a great job of that against a &M with that. We need to keep them off the glass. We didn't do a good job with that. They had 26 old boards, but we also said when they do get a rebound, they don't get points for it. We still got to get stops to give up 26 old boards and to only get outscored by what was it by five? I think on on second chance points was not bad. So I did think we did a decent job still getting st – like Garcia has eight offensive rebounds, only scores three points total. You know, we did a decent job continuing to play guard, not being deflated when you give up an old board. So we're going to have to do that. Now hopefully the 26 old boards we gave up against A&M is significantly reduced and hopefully the turnovers, you know, we can turn up. But, you know, pulling, you know, their point guard – I mean kind of debate who which which one of their guys their point guard but Poland who plays a lot of point for him it's number two in the country and assists a turnover race he doesn't turn the ball over very much so you know it's not like this is a team that comes in turning it over a lot but you know if we could turn our pressure up you know with our guard guarding one of their bigs hopefully we can pressure it a little bit more you know we got to do a better job with that Coach, you've talked a lot here recently about Latrell and, and telling him not to pass up open shots, but where have you seen the rest of his game kind of come together as he's kind of developed into a bit of an X factor for you guys? Yeah, so I think he's leading the uh, league, and if you just look at SEC only games in the 12 games, and three-point percentage, so, you know, it's good he's not turning down too many open shots anymore since he leads the league in three-point percentage, but as far as the rest of it, he doesn't turn the ball over either much. I mean, he's, you know, takes care of it. He's sound. He's solid. His defense has gotten much better for us. It's continuing to get better. You know, he's he, he had the double double here recently. He's been able to rebound it, so he he can impact the game in numerous ways. You know, uh, I don't think he's missed a free throw yet on the year. So he's a guy that you can have in at the end of the games that you can trust with the ball, trust to make free throws and guard. So 
You know, you always talk about starting group and closing group. Well, he's a really good closer. Doesn't miss free throws, doesn't turn the ball over, and guards. So, you know, he, he's he's been really good for us. We need him to continue to develop and grow, and his role is going to continue and increase around here. Uh, Sam Walters coming off a big game against Texas A&M. Also had a lot of rebounds. Just in a game like this when you're going to need those, just what did you see from him, and how can he kind of continue that? Yeah, I mean, we, we talk about, like, contested rebounds, and that was – he's had some games where he's had six, seven before, but a lot of them were ones that fell on his last – I thought he went and got some this last game, like some contested rebounds where he had to fight with some guys. I think he's starting to show some toughness. You know, and shoot, it's a kid that's been super skilled and also – really skinny when he came in you know I telling him like you've put on 20 plus pounds now you got to figure out how to use the 20 plus pounds you put on since you've got here I think he's starting to figure it out you know like starting to actually enjoy some physicality with it so as well as he shoots it and I have told him too like as, as his defense has gotten significantly better here lately and his rebounding you know, I wouldn't mind if you kept the offense uh, going as well. You don't have to pick one or the other. You can be a really good offensive player and a good defensive player at the same time. So, you know, if he can shoot it like he he shot it here, and we know he's capable of shooting it and rebounding and continue to get better at his defense. I mean, he's a really good two-way guy. We can hopefully have an increased role as well. Just a general question about the three-point shot for you here. The three ball from the corner is supposedly tougher than from the wing or from the top because from the corner, the backboard just doesn't give the shooter any perspective. I'm just wondering if your analytics bear that out. I, You know what? With Grant, it does not. He shoots much better from the corners than he does anywhere else, particularly, like I think, the left corner. So, I look, in the NBA, it's different because it's shorter in the corner than it is the rest, you know, above the break. But – Corner three in the NBA actually yields a higher points per shot efficiency than than the rest of them. In college, I think guys have shot enough and been accustomed to it enough, and we work on the corner three enough that, you know, and we feel like when you space the floor, you get more space by going to the corner. Guys help up more in other areas that it might be more open in the corner. We, we – shoot. They, they got to shoot them because we're going to space the corner. I mean, you kind of know how we play. We want to give as much space on the floor as we can. If you crowd up above the break to try to get a, a, a little bit better look instead of a corner three, it screws the spacing all up. So we're, we're going to shoot them. The guys are going to work on it, and I think we've been pretty good. I mean, you know, some of our guys are better in the corner, actually. But I'd, I'd have to pull all everybody's exact numbers on them. We have it somewhere. I don't know it off the top of my head, though. Yeah, you've talked some about how you have some veterans on this team. And, I mean, the numbers bear that out in terms of – I mean, this is by far your most experienced team that you've had here. Um, what, what are the pros or, I mean, even cons of having a team like that? Or, or what kind of does that bring? I don't know if there's any cons. It's nice to have experience. I mean, maybe one con would be they don't improve as much through the year because they're already close to their peak. But with us having so many of them – playing together for the first time new here. I think there's improvement, them playing in a new system, them playing together. So I think we are definitely hitting our peak as we approach the end of the year. In my opinion, it seems to me like we're playing our best basketball now. We've got to get the defense figured out. I think the pros do it are you got guys that, that have been through the grind. I mean, freshmen come in, high school seasons are much shorter. There's way fewer tough games, guys have been through a college grind and know how to get their bodies ready to play, you know, at the end of February and March. I think guys understand the importance of every single game because they've been through it before. You know, experienced guys, I think, are able to bring it. Now, it's not always the case, but bring it on a more consistent basis. It's not they can't just show up good one game and not the other, but I think there's some more consistency, if you will, with experienced players. And I think we're seeing a little bit of that, too. So those are some of them that come to me off the top of my head. Yeah, 
Yeah, Nate, I'm sure you uh, saw the shot chart already against Texas A&M, but what does it mean, you know, every shot kind of came either from two feet out or from beyond the three-point line? You mentioned with hitting your peak, you know, how have you seen that kind of improve with players taking less of those, you know, low percentage mid-ranges and sticking to the shots that you like to see? Yeah, I, I, I didn't actually see it. I remember one long two. Reitzel hit that one with his foot on the line, which is a little frustrating. So we must have, every shot except that one was either like in the paint or outside three. Yeah, yeah. Perfect, right? For all you analytics guys, when we did our math lesson in here, that's how it's supposed to look. So, look, I, some guys come in playing, and every guy that transfers in comes in in a much different system. There's not that many teams in college playing like we play. So it's not just telling them. It's them seeing how you generate these types of shots. Because before, you know, a lot of college systems, the guy beats his man, there's a post player right there. Well, you kind of have to pull up and shoot it long too because you can't get to the rim. With us, we don't have guys in the way. You can get to the rim. So it's them getting comfortable playing in the system. It's – and look, I, people always say, you know, you don't allow your guys to shoot mid-range. That's not true. We do because if you come and watch us practice in the summer, there's a lot more mid-range being shot. We allow them to shoot them. It's just – Every few weeks, I pull the guys in, go through their shot reports, where are your most efficient shots coming from. All right, you know, when you shoot, we're getting a 1.1. If you took a lot less, you know, Brandon Miller, for instance, I think in like the summer and the fall was like at 34.5% of his shots were from non-rim twos. Well, by the time he got to conference play last year, only 12 I think 12.8% or whatever, 12% of his shots were non-rim too. So he had to learn how to play in the system, what, what's more efficient, and he, he made his game way more efficient. Now, you know, he's taken a few more probably non-rim twos in the NBA. I mean, you got a shorter shot clock, you end up having to take some tough shots at that league. But, you know, I think we looked a couple of years ago, every, every NBA team, but I think but maybe two eighty percent of their shots had come from three and in the lane. So, I mean, they're, every NBA team's got an analytics department that's talking to the coaching staff, and they're trying to figure out how to play the most efficient way. We're trying to figure out how to play the most efficient way. That shot chart against A&M was – I don't have it in front of me. What, do you guys remember what our, our points per possession were on in the A&M game? I think it was close – like a 1-3-7, if I remember right, off the top of my head. But like a, close to a 1-4, which is – very high, and and they're typically a pretty good defensive team. So to, to have that efficient of an offense against a decent defensive team, you, you've got to have the right types of shots being taken. So hopefully we see a lot more shot charts like that uh, that look like that. Just no long twos from Aaron. It seems like Aaron and Trelly seem to have their foot on the lines a little bit more than some of the rest of the guys. They're probably the Two guys that didn't play in our system that play the most minutes, you know, because Ryland and Mark played here last year. And we don't shoot. We definitely don't take shots with our feet on the line. That's for sure. So, all right, another math lesson. Every once a week, we'll get a math lesson in. <laughs>